Coming at you from Stretch Wolf Studio. It's that time again to rage across the internet. It's your very favorite Werewolf the Apocalypse podcast. As always, I'm your host, Porter. Across from me, as always, the owner of the world's largest lint ball, Mr. Daniel Tyson. Hey, everybody. How you doing, Danny? Oh, I'm, oh, I'm great. Today is a special day. Is it? It's a special day. Are you sure? I'm very sure. I agree. And I'll tell you why. Hit me. And, and I'll tell you what. I'm actually, I'm actually going to be serious for a minute here, which I know don't freak out everybody. Yeah, it doesn't happen very often. We're going to have a moment of sincerity here. Now, we went live on March 15th, 2020. And oops on us for missing that anniversary. Well, we'll get it next year, I swear. <laughs> but, but this was a project that I aggressively had to be talked into. Oh, yeah. And, um, you know, I sat down in front of the microphone with these people that I held dear and started talking about something that I loved. And it didn't take long for me to fall in love with the show, too our community with what we're doing here and and you know there have been moments there's been i mean there's been some bad with the good you, you got to take that that's life but sometimes there's shit you just don't see coming sometimes there's shit you don't expect and, and sometimes there's stuff you know yeah you, you like to talk about you what you have your little pipe dreams you know what if wouldn't this be cool and the damnedest thing is that one of those is about to happen so it is my honor and privilege to sit here and introduce you all to the architect of the world of darkness mr mark Rainhagen. mark Hello, hello. Uh, nice to be here. Thanks for having me. It, thank you so much for being here. Thank I mean, you. <laughs> thank you for being here, Mark. It, it's a huge honor to even have you on our show. Uh, yeah, it's uh, a, a busy day on Easter, but uh, we're, we're going to make it work, aren't we? So uh, <laughs> really, really happy to have uh, managed to juggle everything happening today. You know, I'm not particularly religious myself, but my family is, and I honor them, so... So anyway, happy, happy we could make it work. Uh, so do I. And we definitely appreciate, you know, yes. I mean, I know we've been working to schedule this for a bit and we, we kind of oops on that, but we, we appreciate you carving out the time for us. And, you know, and, and I mean, obviously, thank you for being here, but thank you for the world of darkness. And <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> yes. Thank you for your creation. Yeah, it's pretty wild. We're still talking about it all these years later. You know, uh, it's pretty cool. It is. Uh, you know, it's cool. It's still, it's still, still rocking and rolling. You know, a lot of role playing games get forgotten, so it feels like a true privilege that people are still uh, not only playing uh, my games, but they're um, talking about them. So that's great. Well, I'll tell you, we we've been talking about this game for about four <laughs> years now. Yeah, um, on air in front of essentially the world, almost <laughs> weekly for the last four years. But, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, um, and for those of you out there, if this is your first show, and I sense it might be. Uh, <laughs> there, there's probably a few that might, this might be their first one. But um, for also for you, Mark, you know, for me, um, this game, you know, Werewolf was presented to me. You know, I, I was just a kid and, you know, uh, I think I was 13 years old. I had a buddy tell me he got this new Werewolf game for Christmas and he comes over to spend the night. And we're going to play games all night and how excited I am. And I'm got my, my Super Nintendo and my Genesis. I'm like, which one are we going to do? What's it going to be? And he shows up, and he puts a book in my lap. And I've never played a TTRPG before. And so, you know, only knowing D&D, I made fun of him for a good half hour. <laughs> I, I asked if, if, you know, if the virginity goes, like, is it, is it how many pages? Is that how many years it's backed up? I, I gave him the whole line, every, you know, every trope, every, every you know, in the planet. And he finally gets me to shut up. Which, uh, if you know me, that's a bit of a feat. <laughs> And I, and I, I opened the book in this first page. It's the second edition core, to be clear. And here's the comic. And I started on this comic because I had always been a comic guy and I fell in love with this book as of that comic. You know, yeah, which is uh, kind of amazing because uh, I got so much flack for the comic book, right? <laughs> Did you really? People were saying like, oh, yeah, you know, you always have people in the company who think they, you know, because they, they want to be useful right and so they and i i actually you know i want people to be the devil's advocate and tell me i'm wrong because you know sometimes i am but sometimes people take it very seriously right <laughs> sure and and there are people who are um you know like like that's really dumb you know like why are we doing that like you know that's not that's not who we are you know we're literary like that and i said well vampire was literary you know, but we're going for a new audience with, with you know, the Werewolf. And the whole idea of all the different games was to each one have its own audience, and yet they still combine together to be one 
fan base, but you know, we're going for the comic book crowd. We're going for people who love that kind of storytelling, you know, and, and I, and I've always been a comic book fan. And, um, and in fact, uh, I couldn't afford comic books growing up, but I made friends at the drugstore. And whenever back in the day, when you, ha- when the comics didn't sell, you would rip the covers off and then the, the drugstore would send the covers back in and get repaid. But that meant the covers were gone, but the, you had all the comic books with no covers. <laughs> so I had an enormous <laughs> collection. So I got to, cause I did work for them and, and, you know, and I mailed the comic book covers and I ripped them off for them and I stacked the comics and I kept it looking nice. And I got other kids to buy comic books. I had this vast collection of comic books with the covers ripped off. <laughs> that's fantastic. like like literally thousands and thousands of comic books that's you know a, bigger than anyone amazing. else but i never you know i would forget what the co- cover looked like you know but it, it'd be a, a real bitch game keep them in order too it's like yeah i was reading uh, uncanny x-men number something and it was great <laughs> yeah but in a way though the, the cool thing was is that you would get to see you would just open one and you would find out what it was as you read it you know like it, oh, it was yeah. a, it was a, it was a surprise box, you know. It was like a you never knew what you're gonna get, like a box of chocolates uh, for Forrest Gump style. What was your uh, your favorite comics when you were growing up? Then, uh, when I was a little kid, shamefully it was Richie Rich and like those kind of comics. <laughs> but as I grew older, uh, you know, I was definitely uh, a Marvel kid. You know, it just seemed more cool and grown up. You know, I, I did love. Um, I did love having, uh, you know, initially Batman was like my big guy. Oh, sure. You know, so I went from Richie Rich to Batman to, you know, to anything Marvel. You know, Stan Lee was kind of my god. Uh, understandable. <laughs> I think the same goes for everyone here as well. well yeah, he, yeah. He, he so, and, I, and you could, of course, see the influences of Stan Lee and Werewolf, you know. <laughs> <laughs> like you know it's, it's sort of it's all about the big concepts the big ideas you know the with modern problems you know simple and not simple but very uh well relatable um relatable and and and, and bared back storytelling you know not trying to be like you know this this huge complicated plots but these very direct plots of of trying to stop someone doing wrong and not always succeeding, but, but, you know, but realizing that it was up to you to do something, you know, which is where the whole werewolf thing of, you know, you, you, you realize you're not always doing right, right? Sometimes your rage takes control and you're doing actually bad and you're not doing the right thing. You're not doing what you set out to do, but you can't help it. And doing something is better than doing nothing. So I well, love that. Absolutely. And I, I got to tell you, that's something that really helps cement you know, because I, I mean, I'm not gonna, but I could go on for quite some time about the influence that, well, that the world of darkness and the werewolf had on me. And oh, sure. But um, something, one of the larger points that really attracted me over something like D&D was that the world of darkness was a simulacrum of our world, right? And I've said this on the show a few times, you know, you look at a setting like D&D and, and it's a fantastic world, right? And there's these, these mythical creatures. And because of that, there's a lack of context. Or it's a huge lack, unless you've been doing it for years. Well, even then, the that. world could vary based on how what your DM does. That you too. know, I like to say that you know, if I'm walking down the street in D and D and a slime jumps out of the woods, I don't know if that's dangerous. I do, however, know what a Buick is. So if I'm walking down the street of the world of darkness and a Buick comes by, I know how to react to that. Yes, yes, and the modern world was very important to me to do that. The games that I did uh, that had won all these awards but not many fans, was uh, Ars Magica. And because I love medieval history, and because I love actual history, you know, and not sort of fake history, and because D&D players kind of drove me crazy because they would always sort of play American suburbia in like a fantasy. It was like, it was like almost D&D was set in Renaissance Fair rather than a, a real time, you know? And so Fairly. I set Ars Magica in what we call Mythic Europe which was like a version of our historical times. And the trouble that players always said is that I feel I need a degree to play this game because we don't understand. Like, like I don't know how to describe like what did peasants eat? 
And I go, well, that's simple. You blah, 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 blah. And, well, then how did it work? Did they, you know, <laughs> did they really have to give their daughters to the king? No, it was the, it was the local noble. It didn't usually happen, but sometimes, yeah, you had to give your daughter over before marriage, you know, uh, but it didn't happen all the time. And anyway, it was just complicated because people understand it. So I knew that with werewolf and vampire and everything, but I could set it in a, in a fantasy, in a in mythical Europe or a fantasy world, but people didn't really understand what that was. But they do know their own city, don't they? Right? They do know their own backyard. They know it really well. They right. intuitively understand it, and it's much easier to role play because you can just describe, like, yeah, you're running past uh, Stetson's gas station, right? <laughs> and then everyone immediately knows where they are, and you can you can play it, you know. And Werewolf is played less in your own city, but Usually when I ran it, it was played within 100 miles of where we lived, you know? Not always, but a lot. That was at least home base, you know? It makes and sense. it just makes it, it makes so sense. much easier. You know, and everyone understands America, right? They've seen so many movies, uh, you know? So even if you live in middle nowhere, Montana, you understand what a strip mall is, you know? Right. Exactly. And in fact, there are many strip malls in Montana, so... <laughs> Sadly. So, so now... With Ars Magica, right, that was your very first. Well, first published, yeah. First published, okay. Now, that's more of, you know, the mage aspect, correct? Yeah, that was basically uh, medieval mage. Okay. And mage was meant to be a bit more like Ars Magica, and that Ars Magica would definitely be like what mage was in the Middle Ages. And then Stuart, because I was so busy then doing live action and finishing up, werewolf and we're gonna he took mage and of course he wanted to do his own thing so so he sort of did more of his own thing and then i came in afterwards and kind of massaged it a bit and that's that's fair and and it kind of makes sense because i was always curious on why mage was kind of like the third in line when it comes to world of darkness especially being you know that was your first published yeah, yeah. I mean, it was basically because Mage was, I knew werewolves would be more popular than Mage, which didn't end up being necessarily true, by the way. But I thought that just, and also that I wanted, um, I think, you know, the, the new thing I've added to like the world of tropes is that I, as far as I know, maybe some anime did it before me and I accidentally stole it and don't realize it, but I'm pretty sure I'm the first one to sort of make it so that werewolves and vampires hate each other and are mortal enemies and have an eternal war, right? And so I did that from the very beginning of Vampire. I knew that, that werewolves would be their, their big enemy. And so it made sense for werewolf to be the next game because then you have a villain for the vampires to fight and the werewolves have a villain ready made in the vampires. So it worked out. And so that's sort of why I did werewolf seconds. Also, I knew that werewolf being, and back then, you know, game games were sold to comic book stores and there were a lot of comic book stores, uh, less true now that, that we, that this, that werewolf would let us really get a foothold in, 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 in comic book stores. So it was basically a combination of art considerations and just practical, you know, you have, you have employees, you got to give them a salary. Once you have employees, you know, you're stuck. You, you, you can't <laughs> skip, you can't, you can't skip a paycheck, you know, you're, you have this working. enormous, you got, you have this enormous weight on your shoulders and it's not like, you know, like later on I worked on, you know, was the coast and match the gathering. And that was just money just appeared out of nowhere. You know, <laughs> you, you almost, you almost didn't need employees other than the one, you know, or writing the checks and ordering more cards printed. Right. Right. <laughs> you know, but with, 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 when you're doing books like white wolf was, you know, you do need to staff and you need to continually pump out books. And so you've got to be really, really strategic on what you do and why and when, so that you, you don't accidentally screw up and then suddenly a book doesn't sell and you have 10 employees, you got to say, I can't pay you, you know? And that's always was my fear well, see, that, I, you know, I, I couldn't pay someone. See, I've avoided that by, by not paying Danny at all so far. <laughs> and that, that seems to be a business model that's working out for me. <laughs> hey, listen, you know, it's a business model, <laughs> right? I mean, as long as I get that promise, it'll be I'm any day now. Giving him the business, but hey, it's you know, no. Um, now I I could sit here and talk to you all day about what I'm sure I know Danny could too. Sit here all day and talk to you about werewolf, and I, and I know there are plenty of questions 
um, that we both have and stuff, things to talk about. But I, I want to make sure, because I know we only have so much time with you, that I want to take a break. I want to circle back to the world of darkness 100% absolutely, but I want to talk about what you're working on now. And I think you do too. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah. I suspect sure, you want to. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what I'm working on is is the thing called Lothlorn. And basically, this is my original, this is a version of my original D&D campaign where I really started going to town and, you know, spending weeks giant drawing like literally 10 foot wide maps of cities Holy where every shit. house was detailed and, you know, and took my model train set and took out the, the train tracks and just turn it into a, you know, a battle map with mountains and hills and stuff so they could role play and dungeon underneath it. You know, I went <laughs> kind of nuts. Right. And, and, and what I, and it was really my first project where I learned to write, you know, and I kept submitting articles to, um, dragon magazine, which was the big magazine back then, you know? And so anyway, I knew I wanted to be a writer, and basically what it is, it's going to be kind of like the world of darkness, but in a fantasy world. So the first game is called Fang Knight, which is where you play the vampires. And then we have Badlander, where you're basically playing the hunters. The Badlanders are humans who hunt the monsters, and they fight monsters to protect humanity. And then third is Beast Knight, which is our werewolf game, where you pay basically... Um, these noble families who are hiding the secret. The vampire, the werewolves in this world are the ones who have the masquerade. Everyone knows who the vampires are. They actually have castles called fireholds where they hold back the, these vents that go lead to hell, to the abysma. But the werewolves are the ones in hiding who, who they're noble families who secretly are werewolves. And they're trying to fight the chaos and fight the vampires. And it's just a whole thing. So pretty excited. It's the D20 system, but just like World of Darkness, your character sheet has dots. Only in this case, they're diamonds. Uh, <laughs> so, so no dots, but diamonds. But you, you have five. Each stat has five diamonds, and uh, that's basically you take your ability plus your skill, and you add those together, and then you add that to your d twenty roll. So it's kind of like D. It's kind of like D and D meets storyteller system. Oh, this is fantastic! And, so it's the and, best and of both worlds. It's the best of both worlds, oh, yes, and and it's and it's meant to be something that you will be able to convince your D and D friends to play it because you'll say, "Hey, it's D twenty, Then they go, "Wait a minute, this sheet looks weird." Well, it's just your proficiency <laughs> bonus. It's just shown as as a visuals instead of a number, you know. And I love the visuals because unlike most gamers, I understand that most human beings are scared of math. They're math phobic. Right. If you have a bunch of numbers and a piece of paper, their eyes glaze over and they don't want to play. Right. That's why originally for Storyteller, I did that because I knew that, you know, back in the 90s. Right. That's when they had the Barbie doll that said math is hard. Right. <laughs> and girls were, and, girl, and girls were told that that they don't like math and math was hard. You know, and so I wanted to make a game that would just sort of, you know, would have a lot of math in it, but it was hidden. So it wouldn't intimidate people, you know, because because, you know. There's no point in intimidating people. You want to make your game as open to as many different people as possible. And and so I definitely kept that aspect. And so, yeah, I think it's going to be great. The world is awesome. Lost Lorne is just uh, an amazing. It's kind of like uh, in Vampire and Wraith, you have the, I forget what they're called, the Lost Realms, where the souls go after they die. The Far Realms, what do they call it? Anyway, Lost Lorne is, has, that's where the idea came from. Lost Lomer is basically, in my fantasy campaign, was the place where all the dead souls who were lost at sea ended up. And so it's a fantasy world where, where it's connected to Earth. They know about Earth, but it's been around for thousands of years, and it's where the, 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 anyone who drowned on Earth or lost at sea kind of ends up as reborn. So there's these wave and waves and waves of invaders from Earth. And the latest wave is called the Pureborn. And they're the more standard humans. And you have all of the other races, not your elves and dwarves, but our own creation. And most importantly, we have the vamp. It's, it's all about the vampires and the werewolves and the, the, the different monsters that you can play as player characters. Only this time, of course, you'll be able to play dragons and the, all the other you know fantasy monsters, as well as the classic horror ones. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, I, I kind of love the idea of uh, playing a werewolf, like a, like a flail and a, bro a broadsword or something, <laughs> you know, I, there's, there's something about that that already, 
I'm kind of into that. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, come on. I mean, that's the whole werewolf thing, right? It's it's sort of guru the talking. Let's take care of this shit, right? Well, hey, so, there's, there's so, plenty, you know. You, and, and you know, there's plenty of talking. There's plenty of, of doing that, but there's a you always have that moment. Right. Yeah. It's kind of like, it's kind of like the Hulk in the, the old TV show, you know, just before the commercial break, he has to Hulk out. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing, you know, and it's something I love about werewolf too. Um, I'm bringing just for a second to bring that back is that in, in this world you created is there's the, the emphasis on storytelling on character development and world building. And yeah, we're playing werewolf. So we also get to take a break and freak out and destroy stuff. So again, <laughs> um, this, this sounds pretty great, uh, that what you're building here. And I think, uh, added bonus of this too is like you mentioned with D and D players, you know, you can get them hooked here and go. So, you know, the absolute badass who made this also made this thing called the world of darkness. Yes. Yeah. And, 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 and it'll, be easy, it'll be easy transition because the dots from the diamonds will be easy. It's easy to, you know, so, so it's basically, yeah, it's meant to be like a feeder fit system, you know? Well, and then, right. Now that we've got you hooked in the world of darkness, there's this badass podcast. <laughs> so look at that. Look at that. We all win. <laughs> Full circle. Look at that. <laughs> We're all winners. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Yeah. <laughs> now, now I know in terms of uh, what, you know, what you've got uh, going on, again, it sounds really exciting and you would make the joke and to, to bridge the gap between. And I don't think that's not going to happen. <laughs> We're not going to try that again. Yeah. Best of both worlds. That's so fucking cool. <laughs> But you know, yeah, I'm 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 pretty pleased with it. I, I think that, um, and, and we really did some innovative stuff. Like we have a scene difficulty, so you just have a giant D twenty on the table, and eventually <laughs> we'll sell a D twenty that goes from ten to thirty rather than from one to twenty. But really, you just take the one through you know uh, nine, and that's your twenty one through twenty nine. And it just makes it so easy to, to it, the, the, it's just so much faster than either storyteller or D and D combat and uh, armor basically blocks damage. So your plate armor is like a four. So it block if you roll any damage you roll, uh, anything above a four it blocks. So really, the weapons that are good at puncturing plate armor are the ones that have like three. The one uh, there's some weapons that are three d four, and so they don't do a lot of damage, but they're designed specifically against plate. So it really adds a lot of uh, like a Rommel dagger was used on plate, right? And it was the, a dagger with that round stud on the end, so you just punch it. You could find a crack and just slam your gauntlet into it and punch it through the armor. So that's okay. That's a three D four armor. So it really, in a very simple way, is that really makes the weapons different, which is what you kind of want in a game, even if it's not exactly accurate. It just feels good, you know, to have weapons be different. Whereas, uh, you know, one D sixteen or a one D uh, weapon is different than a one D twelve suddenly because twelve can be blocked by armor, right? Hmm. No, that's that's excellent. So anyway, I don't want to go into the, in the mechanics. I just talk about it because I was just working on it. <laughs> oh, hey, hey. <laughs> so, I mean, it was- so, so, you know, that's, that's exactly the rules. You can probably tell. Those are the rules that I was just working on. <laughs> no. uh, and then also <laughs> presentation style, we're, we're doing it where um, each page is a full-page piece of art with the text, with the art design, so that text can kind of fit into the dark areas. So it's a lot of very dark art, but it has, but the, but the art and the, uh, the text is integrated together. So every single page is a full page piece of art. And I think it's pretty cool. Oh, that's fantastic. You know, so that once again, I'm going for that comic book sort of feel, which I love. And then, uh, you know, also, you know, understanding that the modern reader is not what the reader was like in the nineties, right? In the nineties, we were starved for content. Right. The internet was just begun. A lot of people still weren't on the internet and the internet had almost nothing on it. Right. It was mainly for email. You know, <laughs> you didn't even have a thesaurus. I had to use, I was using a, a up until the, the two thousands, I was still using a, a, a physical thesaurus, you know? <laughs> um, but anyway, we were start, we were star for content. We wanted content. Right. And so you could write on and on and on. And people would love it because it had so much content now because of the, the phone. Everyone is just overwhelmed by content and information and they want less of it. They want it easier presented and they want it presented simpler with less words and just easier to take in and easier and quicker to learn. So it's, it's a very different market. People want a different thing. They still want that world that 
wraps them up and is a beautiful and, and feels good, but they don't want to feel like they have to work for it. You know, Makes sense. the way you do to learn a new app, right? Sometimes learning a, a new, a new app is just a lot of work. And you're like, Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> right. And you don't want your game to be an Oh no moment. Right. <laughs> no, absolutely. You, you know what that does is it gives me flashbacks to some of those old board games back in the day, you know, like your hero quest. And I know there were a bunch like that. They were more complicated. You know, you had to set up the the stuff, and you always had these, yeah. You know, and I mean, I used to play war games where I had. I remember playing one war game with my dad. It was like fifty pages of of tightly spaced rules, every rule numbered. You know, t- rule twelve point four point three point seven. You know, <laughs> no, exactly, it, and it took so long to set up. Yeah, right, it took like, longer to yeah, set up the actual yeah. play. Right, and and it's it's just like that. It's like it was so much trouble to do. That you'd have it, and someone come o- would come over and be like, "Oh, let's play that." And you'd be like, "No, nah, let's let's not, because it's going to take three hours before we start." Yeah, yeah. But back then, role playing was the easy option. No, no, we already made characters. Let's just role play. It'll <laughs> right. be easier, you know. <laughs> and now people are like, "Yeah, yeah, let's play Catan rather than." And even Catan is considered a long setup, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's, I've, I've done you know, that a couple times a, with some friends, and it's like, holy shit, this oh, takes a Yeah, yeah. You just gave like the, the, the next The next Catan is going to be something where you just shake the box, flip it upside down, whichever random way it gets organized, that's the board. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's, that's going to be the next most popular game, like setup that takes... You know, shake the box, flip it over. That's the game. Yep, <laughs> I agree. That's just probably you know, and, that's, and, and that's why our, our, our uh, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was, I was agreeing with you. That's all. So yeah, the new. That's why in the new, uh, which we call House Rules D twenty, the new game system is that it literally you can make a character in three minutes. Wow. You know, hmm. so it, it, it's kind of like what well, that's once you know the the world a little bit, right? Like if you have to read what all the clans or houses or you know um you know lineages are right of course it'll be a bit longer right but once you kind of know things a little bit you can definitely make a character pretty quick and i think that's important for two reasons first of all you can get going much more quickly than a normal game and then secondly that means if the game master threatens to kill your character you believe it because the game has to go, listen, you can always make up a new one pretty quick, you know? And, 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 and I, and I think that's very important, right? Like the players have to believe whether it's real or not, that you would kill their character because otherwise there's no risk or danger, you know, on some level, the players need to feel like, Oh yeah, I could lose. And your character dying is kind of like the, the ultimate way you can lose. Right. Yeah, I, I agree there. Now, I mean, you know, we have our actual play series that we do as well. So you know, let me real quick, Danny. Mm-hmm. I'm asking Danny a question now. We got, we got, we got Mark Ryan Hagen. I mean, I'm asking Danny the question. <laughs> do you feel worried for your character at times? Almost every single time. <laughs> all right, I feel like I'm doing all right then. Thank you. Back to you, sir. Back to you, Mark. <laughs> now, but now, have you actually killed a character? I have. Yeah, okay. So how, when's, the, when's the last time? Oh, uh, well, we had one uh, happen. This chronicle uh, that we aired, that that was due to a, a character or a player having to leave. But um, I've killed maybe half a dozen, I think, characters yeah. in my. I, I think it's important to kill a character once in a while, not not because you want to, but because it keeps things real. You know, it's it's an honesty check, and it just sort of makes the game so much better. Yeah. No, now, I'm now, sure. and occasionally, our players quit over that, but it's, you know, it's a risk. But as long as you go by it honestly, I think it has you know, to be honest. You know, I've always I've always put an emphasis on you get which you get out what you put in, and and I've always put emphasis on character growth and development in making you know something we say around here is you know get out of cardboard town, you make your characters and your world as real as humanly possible, so you you bridge that bond between character and player in the world. I mean, Danny has more than once talked about uh, the the world and how it's affected him through his character and that relationship. Yeah, being that character has has helped me grow even as a person. Uh, I'm, I'm very shy in the open world and, and I, I stick to myself. I barely even talk to people like I'm really bad at public speaking. But yet we do this podcast now where it's almost weekly and I'm talking to the entire world almost. <laughs> Our numbers aren't that good. <laughs> wow. Wow. So you're, We've you're reached actually out to strangers the world. and starting conversations. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> 
but at the same yeah, time, no, no, I, I think that, that's the beautiful thing about role playing, right? That, yeah. That's why I always really um, champion. One of the reasons why I champion role playing is such a beautiful art form is that you know, like what there's only one other way generally in which people can use something as a crutch for social, and that's drinking, right? <laughs> and, and, and drinking is actually very bad for how people in the social situation because as long as you're lightly drinking, it works great, but then inevitably you slide into heavier drinking and it suddenly become it ruins your social game, right? Again, and so, yeah. it, it, well, it, 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 you know, you have to sort of. Yeah, it depends on the person, you know. Like, I, <laughs> but largely, I tend yeah. to be very, I tend to be very fun and jovial throughout. But I'm sure there's people who've said, "Oh, no, you, you got a little out of hand there, and that wasn't fun for me," you know. And I, I wouldn't have noticed that, right? <laughs> I mean, I, so, I hear you, but I, I have plenty of stories that I can't tell on air. <laughs> <laughs> a few too many drinks. Yeah, yeah, but but I think role playing is a very it does the same thing without th those consequences and that's especially true of LARP and I am just constantly amazed by the number of people who have come up to me over the years over over a well not, maybe not over a thousand but certainly many hundreds of couples saying that they got together because of gaming and that's honestly awesome. not nothing makes me feel better like the fact that that vampire and werewolf began bringing girls into women into the um into gaming in a way that never happened before. Gen Con, remember the Gen Con after Vampire came out, everyone was coming up to me in the industry going, what the hell did you do? They're all here for you, Mark. And I go, well, they're not here for me. They're here for the games. But, uh, but yeah, Gen Con in one year went from one person in 20 was a girl to one in three. And it was a dramatic overnight transformation. It was incredible. Yeah. Can, I, I remember, and, and, and that, that's what that I'm really. Pro I'm really proud of that, and and uh, and, and, and that, uh, that suddenly people who were different in whatever way felt comfortable in the industry, and so people who had who beat to their own drummer, you know, danced to their own drummer, were suddenly welcome, and you had all kinds of people coming in the industry as well. You know, I think it's pretty cool. Like I, I'm, you know, I I travel a lot. I'm I'm cool with all kinds of people. So for me, you know. Being welcoming was cool, right? I think that's the cool thing about it. And I think, I think all the games have done that to one degree or another. All the games I've done. I mean, I'm, I mean, the proof's in the pudding, right? I mean, we, we know that for a fact. And, and absolutely, thank you for, for your contribution, yeah, bringing, yeah, bringing, yeah, bringing yeah, the girls well, to, the, know, to the hobby. You know, but let's face it, the world it was, of darkness it was, was it cool. It was just something I, I, was, uh, I was into. So it's just good to get people from different walks of life to game together, I think. That's what I always loved about gaming, you know? Like, I had these super lefty friends and these super right-wing friends, and we are all gaming together, right, in college. And, you know, and it was just sort of like, you know, back then it was more friendly, though, right? <laughs> Today, everyone hates you. They're online, at least. They hate each other. But but back then, we just game together and just good-naturedly argued about stuff, right? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> so, you know, and I always loved it about gaming. It's like, oh, we're all kinds of people, you know, and we all kind of get along. So, yeah, that's it's something I've always felt strongly about, you know, as I've said, and I've, I've said on the show a few times is that, you know, yeah, for as much the, the is there is out there today, so, so many polarizing things, and there's so much that just pulls people apart and puts people at odds with each other. You know, it's something that I've always wanted to focus on is this is the thing that brings us together. Yeah. You know, I, I, I don't, you know, we, we have, we have gaming, we have werewolf in this case. We're all in this together. And that's the thing we need to focus on. You know, yeah, and yeah, and, and, not, and not fight over stupid stuff, you know. Right. Like, it's okay right. to like disagree, when, but yeah, let's yeah. focus on what keeps us together. But but that's why little enclaves where everyone can still get along are so important, you know. And, uh, you know, it's pretty cool. Like, um, and, and I think werewolf really does that well. Like, like uh, in Scandinavia, you know, werewolves have a connotation as being associated with the with those guys who burned down the churches in Norway. Did you hear about this? No, no. There, there is the the heavy metal bands. Heavy metal is really big in Scandinavia, and they have they use a lot of werewolf iconography. And there is this group of heavy metal guys who were really anti-religious because they came from these small towns that were very religious, and they started burning down these these really old churches that were made of wood because in Norway they build them of wood, right? Uh, and really gorgeous, these gorgeous staff churches. I don't know if you've ever seen a staff church. They're gorgeous, just beautiful, beautiful 
700 year old, 500 year old churches and burning them down. So anyway, werewolf has kind of a connotation with sort of, you know, these crazy kids. Well, anyway, in Denmark to sort of combat this, they have a, um, they have a, a regular meeting, a fire where people go to play werewolf. But the way they play werewolf is you come as your, your human version of your werewolf character. And then you, you, everyone takes turns standing up and telling the story of what happened to them since the last time they were at the fire. Sounds oh. like a moot. Yeah, it's a moot. It's an actual moot in the woods, but they're literally doing it. That's that's pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I thought <laughs> I it was pretty awesome. That. You know, um, yeah. So, and there's all kinds of people, right? So, and they're all together, and 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 I think in other other countries, not America, where they're much more. You do see all kinds of people together, right? At that gaming convention, and it's no big deal. Hmm. But I think we'll be back to that soon in, in gaming in America. I think. I think uh, things are about to change back to where they used to be a little bit more, at least. Well, we can hope. Oh yeah. And I mean, we're certainly trying to do our part with that. Fight the good fight. <laughs> you know, moving back to where of something, um, something I've been curious about for a while. I'm wondering maybe you can confirm or deny for me. Help me out with this. You know, I was looking back toward uh, the first edition, you know, first edition of werewolf. And you can, you can see a very real difference in what was originally thought in term as opposed to what uh, eventually became, you know, like those first versions of the tribe, they, they seemed a lot more distant from each other. It felt like yeah. there were very real plot lines that were going on within a tribe. And, and I look at that and it, and it, it, it feels to me like it backs up a theory of mine because you look at some of those first edition books, like like rite of passage where it specifically talks about certain tribes, rite of passages. And I had this theory looking at some of them, right? It, is that, the original intent was probably for games to be played as a single tribe game. And, and you used the, and the camps existed as sort of Kmart versions of other tribes. You know, like for example, if you're going to play a get a, you're, you're going to play a game of werewolf, but you're going to play a get a Fenris game. Everyone's going to be a get a Fenris, but you have that holdout who wants to be a black fury. Well, now we have the Valkyrie of Freya camp, which is just basically the Kmart black furies. It's like the compromise. Am I onto something on this or am I just in the talk? Yeah. Place? I mean, that, that's the way I prefer even now to run it. Um, but back then, definitely I ran it where you would try and get one or what, a two or three players all be the same tribe. And then that would be sort of the setting for your tribe. And then, then the other players would basically be friends from other tribes who were kind of adopted into this tribe, you know? And so it kind of makes sense out of it, you know? So they were, they were basically like cousins or, or distant cousins, you know, or friends who sort of been picked up, adopted in, or whatever. But, but like your, you know, get a Fenris would be your social milieu, milieu you know. And I, I like to make sense out of stories in a way that feels less like gaming and more like a novel or a movie or, or, you know, real life, right? Absolutely. So that it's not like you're just a bunch of, you know, it can work where you, you know, you don't really have a tribe. And you're this motley crew. That's a classic story, right? The the orphans come together. But, you know, generally in life, people have families, right? <laughs> you know, and, <laughs> and family is really important to your life. And for most of humanity, like, you live with your family, right? You know, and in fact, until the Christian church made marrying cousins illegal, you know, most of the world was, was, liter was literally, you know, for most of human history... You lived in your clan and you married in your clan and your clan is everything. And that's what like we don't we tend to not understand. Like, you know, if you go to Afghanistan, you'll you'll suddenly realize at some point, oh, they live in clans and the clan is everything. They marry in the clan, the clan is everything, right? You know, now you don't marry first cousins usually, but you'll marry a second or third cousin in India it's clan based. You know, China used to be clan based, now it's nothing. And so that's kind of like, you know, the clan is really important. The tribe is really important. So anyway, I, I like to capture that, you know, that how important. And, and even for Americans, you know, even if you come from a very small family, it tends not for everyone, but it tends to be pretty important, you know. No, and if you don't even and if you don't have an actual family, what do you do? You make your own family, right? That's a classic American friend group. We're like family to each other, right? It's built into the human consciousness, family, right? It's it's built in. You need a family, even if you have to make it yourself. No, I, absolutely. 
I understand that absolutely completely, but but thank you for that because I have said that for years, and and there there are those people that have come in and they say, "There's no way you're talking out of your ass." I'm not talking. You hear that, everybody? I'm not talking out of my ass. Nope, you have no idea. As soon as you said yes, the the words yes, <laughs> Porter started doing a little mini happy dance. <laughs> I didn't. You're a liar, and no one likes you at all. <laughs> now. Um, you talked earlier, and, and I feel like I'm about to answer the question I'm about to give you, or that you answered it earlier. You know, you talked to her about the the natural fear we all have of math. <laughs> yeah. Is that the reason between the renown shift from first to second edition? Uh, for the what shit? The, the shift between renown, where, it, you know, in first edition, it used the, the point system, you know, the 1,200 honor, 800 wisdom, as opposed to the, the squares and dots in second edition. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, it's you know, uh, you know, and it's, it's, anytime you can simplify it down, then simplify it, right? Like, like with 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 game systems, like game designers especially tend to be good at math, right? We <laughs> love math, in fact, right? Most game designers, we love math, right? We're musicians in a way, right? Math, music <laughs> is math, and we kind of love the complexities. But when you're designing for an audience who you know, you got to make it simple. And there's two kinds of simple. There's conceptually simple, like it's easy to understand something and pick up on it. And then there's, is it simple to use in the moment, in the middle of a game, in the middle of a scene, in the middle of combat, is it easy to use? And so you want both kinds of simple. You want it to be conceptually simple, so someone can just pick up on it right away and not be like stumped by it. You don't want ever someone be like, what? I don't get it. I don't like it. Because as soon as someone <laughs> says, I don't like it, then yeah. you may have lost one of your players, right? And the thing about role playing is, is that you got to get all of your players to like the game, or someone may leave, and then you won't have a quorum. You won't have enough people to play. Well, so it helps as a if game designer, yes, yeah, so how pictures help, you know? <laughs> but but sim- but simple rules help is key, and you got to make it so that you have something in there for everyone. So that's why you know the tribes try to appeal to different kinds of players, so everyone has something they can grab onto that is theirs. And they go, that's, oh, I like that. Yeah, that's me. Or the vampire, you know, clans, same way, right? They're, they're plastic. You know, they're just, people love them. Now, the mistake we made in the initial episode, version of Werewolf is we had too many tribes. You know, I believe that seven is the largest number that people can hold on to when they first learn something. And seven is like the perfect number of something initially to give. Then you can add on more later. But we should have had seven initially. But but that's the problem, you know. That's a rule of mine, and you don't always follow the rules because people, there are so many, we came with so many good tribes that I couldn't get rid of any. <laughs> I, I, I was going to ask, and, and people might hate me for even asking the question, but if you had to get down to seven, <laughs> which you get rid of? <laughs> you know, I love all my children. I can't pick favorites. <laughs> I knew that was going to be the answer. <laughs> Even if it's down to seven, how can I kill off so many? You know? yeah. How are you going to present a Sophie's Choice moment and then, <laughs> and then refuse? Yeah, you know. <laughs> oh, come on. It, it's it's tough. But, but, but you know I should have and then had the extra ones, you know, there. But that's part of the hard part of game design. But once it becomes public, it becomes impossible. And that's why later editions never cut down the number of, like, classes or tribes or clans or whatever they always add because they don't want to piss off the audience (laughs) but when you're when you're beginning something you can keep it limited and and you know i try to tell the people working in the fifth edition like keep it at seven you know if you want new people buying the game and you definitely do want new people playing it you gotta make it so that it's not too hard conceptually to to grok it you know, to, to, to pick it up. It's got to be, like, easy. But you Especially can't. nowadays when, every, when people are besieged with so much content, so many IPs. It's not like we have a shortage of TV shows anymore, right? It's not like we have a shortage of comic books or novels or games. We have too many. We have, And plus we have web series and we have podcasts and, you know, like there's so much to do. <laughs> You've got to you, you got to keep it so easy, right? Somehow. Well, but at the same time, you you can't you can't take away from people. I mean, I look at it this way, right? No, you, you know, can't. The, the the apocalypse hit in you know twenty twenty four. It was the end of the world of darkness, and it was heartbreaking. I mean, I, I was there, 
you know, I, I was uh, a regular in the old White Wolf HTML chats. I mean, yeah. I, I remember, you know, how some of the staff would come in and hang out. And I mean, this isn't a flex year. It was forever ago, right? But, I mean, I remember that. I, I, was, I was there. I was a part of it. And, you know, not at that higher level, obviously. But I was part of that fan base. And it was heartbreaking to lose the world of darkness. I mean, yeah, the new one was showing up. But that's a different story. And we're not about that story right now. Right. So, the, you know, the world of darkness was essentially dead. And there were people like me and other diehard fans who championed it and kept it going for all those years, arguably so that when the 20th editions came around, that that they were such a success because we we didn't really go anywhere. And so when you get the idea with something like Fifth and then the idea of taking stuff away from people who have loved this so much, you know, or making these massively sweeping changes under the same old name, that's, that's, a, that's a tough pill to swallow. Yeah. I was against ending the road of darkness. I thought it was a cheap marketing ploy and was silly. And yeah, you were right. It, 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 divided, it, divided, it divided the uh, audience and it, it ended the audience. It was just a really dumb move. And um, fortunately, I wasn't in charge at that point. Like my partner, I own 50% of the company, but my partner owned the other 50 and his brother was CEO. So in a case like that, in terms of go- corporate governance, I was out. So... Yeah, I, th- I thought it was. Re- I thought basically that it's really the dumbest thing you could ever do to an IP, right? Um, and, and and to play that game with with gamers, to, with with fans, right? Of ending it, but then not really ending it, and then restarting it. They know what's going on. It just pisses people off, and it's just a convenient way for a large section of the fan base to go. We're done. Yeah. It, it's it's Boom. always okay. Big. You you ended it. Okay, I ended it. Now maybe they'll miss it later on. They probably do miss it later on. But but they're just so mad, and, yeah. and you don't want to piss people off. So uh, you know, it was very foolish. You know, at that time, like World of Warcraft and all those gaming things were coming up, and I think people at the White Wolf thought like actually gaming was was dying. You know, like tabletops, and it was just before. Um, Kickstarter started, you know, which sort of brought the new renaissance, right? Huh. So, um, yeah, what a, but what a mistake. <laughs> I wouldn't have done it. Yeah, well, you know, I, and I, like, I agree. But that's the thing is, you know, you, you did still have people. You had people like me who were out there. You know, I've done my travels through the country, and I, I have set up a group. I have found a group, created a group of people who have never heard of tabletop RPGs everywhere I've lived in this country, which is something I'm a little proud of. <laughs> like, I'll reference the Virginia games. Well, this is what we did when I was in Arkansas. This is what I did over here in Connecticut. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I set up groups everywhere I went. So, it, it, obviously, it didn't die. And there will always be people like me who love the work that you have done so much. We're, we're spreading it. It ain't going anywhere. You know, there, there, those people still exist. And I, I, hope, I hope that feels good. You know, that something you created so long ago is still very much beloved. That is good to hear. It truly is. It's nice to have done it and have people still recognize it. So thank you. Oh, that's awesome. So here's something. Uh, I, I got a question. I got a question for you. Imagine that. <laughs> that's what we're here for. <laughs> right? Jesus Christ. Good job, Porter. But no, something that I've, I've seen come up a lot over the years with Werewolf, it's one of these things where people, you know, people complain, what, they, you know, what can you do? And, and they always, I, I hear this a lot. And it, it's the question of the bunyip. <laughs> I think I know. Okay. And, and I, I, I've told people this for years, but this is one of those, like, just for me to, to hear, to, 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 to bring my, what I think the solution or the reason behind it or the rationale is it was the howling three, right? <laughs> I mean, people I are like, mean, well, that's not accurate. I'm like, well, who cares? It was the howling three. That's why <laughs> it's good enough for me. Am, am I <laughs> off my nut here? I mean, I, uh, I, I was an exchange student to Australia for a year. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I got really into Australian stuff, especially Aborigine stuff. A friend of mine was half Aborigine. I uh, used to listen to a reggae band that was an Aborigine reggae band called, uh, what's their name again? Oh, I can't believe I forgot. Uh, I forget the name. Anyway, so I got really into that stuff. So um, I was just doing what I thought was homage, and I still think is homage, to a culture that people really didn't know about. And I, that was like a way of calling attention to it and making people aware of it, which, you know, back in the nineties was 
important because that's we didn't have the internet really in the same way right so to sort of get people aware of other cultures it was like a whole it was sort of opening a door so anyway that's that's why it's there i mean perfectly fair you know i just i know we've had we we, we have australian listeners we have and i mean there are critics out there it's like, well the thias lead is it's a, it's a marsupial and it's like, well, shut up because the howling three <laughs> it's okay <laughs> can, can we just enjoy it it's fine <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think I ever saw the Howling Three. Oh. Really? I mean, it's not. Yeah, it's, it's a it's a Howling sequel, so I think you already know what to, to expect, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> but as Howling yeah, sequels I'm pretty, go, I'm pretty sure I never saw three. You, know, you also had six, I think, was the one where they fought oh. the vampire. But the vampire looked like a Nosferatu who had been sleeping in that toilet bowl cleaner. Oh, yeah. oh, so his skin was like metallic blue, and it was really disturbing. <laughs> okay, that's, that's disturbing. I'm a bit of a horror fishing out. I don't know what to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like quotes around horror there. Well, I was horrified. Yeah, I was going to say. What, what do you was... do in there, Count Orlock? <laughs> <laughs> Fucking, there wasn't a coffin nearby? <laughs> you got to. <laughs> I don't know, maybe he took a bunch of silver nitrate thinking that would protect him from the werewolf. I, yeah, I don't know. Few people are going to get that joke. I'm not sorry. <laughs> it was worth a shot. So, yeah, I mean, I mean it's, just, it's just one of those things where it was a little... You always want something a little bit fun and weird in the game, right? Like, like you know, for people who want to be fun and different and it kind of fit that role a little bit you know and I, I think you know like i think human culture belongs to all of us and so you don't and, you know and only take it from european gets boring right and it's it is sort of very myopic so you want to borrow widely but of course then when you do some people will accuse you of whatever so it's, it's a very tricky thing you know but I, but personally i think it'd be very very sad if the only place we borrowed from would be was European if you happen to be of European ancestry, you know? No, I, I totally um, agree. And I think that's something, at least I like to focus on with Werewolf, um, or maybe rather something I don't like to focus on. You know, you have the, the heritage of the tribes, and they each came from somewhere originally. But um, yeah. I, don't remember yeah. if, I don't remember if it was in first edition, but I know it was pointed out as early as second edition, that, you know, humans, and it, we shouldn't have to point this out, but like humans have moved on since their original groupings. We have like <laughs> yeah. boats and airplanes and shit. In humanity, yeah. you know, they have this this thing, this pattern we, is where we move around and then we screw. Yeah. So largely, we move and we breed, and that's what we do. It's, it's part of evolution. You know, we watch American <laughs> Idol. Is that still on? I have no idea. Yeah, I don't know either. Um, but <laughs> there are the things that we do. And so, you know, for me, I, I think it's important, or um, I'm more interested personally with the, the culture of the Garu Nation. Because I can look into, like, you know, my ancient ancestry if I'm interested in that. You know, I can look into other cultures if I'm interested in doing that, like human cultures. But yes, that's and you also can go in direction you want. And, and and let's say that you you do have indigenous blood of some kind, which a lot of people do. You know, yeah. and if you want to explore that, you can in this game, right? Whereas if you didn't include that stuff, if you you would feel like, oh, there's no way for me to explore my my culture or my my personal history. You know, so so it's a fine line. But you know, I think I think uh, letting people have fun exploring is, is really the key here. And anyone who is offended, you can just go, oh, yeah, we won't have that in our game, right? <laughs> yeah. well, the, People uh, never seem to understand. Like, I always go, well, if you don't like that part of the game, people ask me this at conventions and complain about something. I go, well, why don't you just not play with it? And they go, oh, yeah, we don't play with it. Well, then what's the issue? And I go, well, that, doesn't, <laughs> doesn't, that solve, doesn't that solve the problem? Well, no, it's still in the book, and I don't like that. And I'm like, well... Maybe someone else needs that or likes it, uh, you know? Yeah. We've actually dealt with very similar issues just to that. And that's always been the answer. Okay, it's just not in your game then. Right. And, you know, and, and yeah. it's a funny thing is, you know, for someone, I mean, there are people who are just going to be mad because they need to be mad because they need that, you know, they, they, they need to feel like they have the high yes, yes. special. And that's just people. You can't help from people. But for me, and, and I don't mind people being mad or offended and talking to me about it. I don't mind at all. What I do matter, mind is that if they go, well, this book has to be banned, yeah, you know, or someone needs to be canceled. Yeah. And, and, and that's when I'm like, like, okay, seriously, you're going to, you know, you're, you're coming at this from a left point of view, but you want to ban a book? Really? 
and you want to cancel a human being for saying something you disagree with? That that seems crazy to me. But but hey, that's that's a valid criticism on my part. And but I, I welcome other people giving valid criticism. It's perfectly fine, you know. Um, that's a dialogue. But as long as it remains a dialogue, it's no problem. No, I'm, I'm inclined to agree. And when we talk about criticism and dialogue, because hey, what are we doing here, right? We're just what what's up with the changing breeds? <laughs> One more. What's up with the what? The changing breeds. Oh. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I should probably get like a more serious question in with that. Okay. Hey, give me a more specific question if you could about changing breeds if you want to. I mean, I feel like why? Talk about that. But obviously, you know, you want to expand the world and stuff like that. And that, that, that's fine. I just, but I am curious as to, um, obviously there was this emphasis on, you know, the Garu are, are just big meanies and we all did everything we could, but even though we were all together and tried to stop the big mean Garu, they somehow beat us all anyway. Which, personally, I've never really bought, but you can look at that through the lens of the unreliable narrator through the course of the books. Um, but let me let me distill that down further to something maybe more interesting. Um, the Nuisha and the Ajaba specifically kind of got shafted through the editions. Why, uh, why was that? You know, that's the, that's the real problem. I think in that case, it was a balance thing and also maybe pressure from different groups on for different, with different agendas, shall we say? I can't get into that, but, wow. um, you know, that's the whole ways the problem with changing something is that you have these built in groups that like something a certain way. And if you change it, they're going to be offended. Right. And so it, it's really tricky. Like, you know, like every time. D and D changed, you know, a character class like bards, right? I mean, there's going to be people who are going to be pissed off, right? No matter what you change, right? Well, sure. You know, having illusionists, getting rid of illusionists, adding this, adding that, whatever it was, right? So it's it's very tricky. But but in terms of an evolving game, and role playing games are ever evolving things, right? They, they're changing all constantly, whether through house rules or official rules. And you sometimes just have to for corporate reasons, for design reasons, for creative reasons. And um, I can't get into exactly why, partly because I don't fully remember, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> That's fair. Right? That's understandable. <laughs> you know, like the exact reason why I'm kind of recalling a little bit, and I'm thinking I'm not supposed to talk about it. Which, but, um, which hey, we don't want to. Because you, you, yeah. sign, you sign all these NDAs, right? And, and it doesn't matter how long it is or if you don't really remember or if it's been years, if you violate the NDA, you're screwed. So yeah, you were, uh, we're certainly, you know. we're not going to put you in that kind of position. Yeah, I we just, don't, uh, just, it's more of a curiosity if you knew and yeah. you don't. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, cause well, you know, obviously the, the Adjub or the Adjubal book, there isn't an Adjubal book, but <laughs> the, the Nuisha book is like 12 pages long. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the best step book by example, and I'm talking about the second edition ones, obviously, because that's where the breed books were. Mm -hmm. That, that best step book is like a small novel. <laughs> I mean, there's, yeah. there's the multiple yeah. tribes. So certainly that makes sense, but you know, the poor new Isha and then the Ajibu get lumped in with the best step. It's like, they're really cool. Yeah. And, yeah they, I do know in general, the whole idea of doing ferals was just to sort of expand the world and do more cool stuff and have more fun, basically, you know, add, just add more cool stuff. So. You know, yeah, um, that was completely understandable. Yeah, <laughs> I think it. You I know, think it's but 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 I, but I think I think it can get get away from you pretty quick. I, I, I'm ten, when I sort of am running something, I tend to be much more conservative about how much you add. Like I, I always tend to say, "Hey," but I'm not always the one calling the shots. You know, White Wolf got so big for a while there, and then plus I had to leave. I didn't have a say anymore, right? But my preference is, I think you should always be very careful about large order things, you know, adding in too much, you know, because it, it, it can kind of get out of control so easily. It's like the Pandora's box. Be careful what you want to wish for. You know, it's, it's like adding in an artifact in a in a campaign, right? A magical artifact is super powerful. You know, it may seem like, oh, I've designed this so it can't ruin everything, but, well, it's probably going to ruin everything, <laughs> you know? You know, that's... It's just so powerful, <laughs> <laughs> it, it's scary how close to home you're, you're hitting with that one. We, we have a series for our backers called the Postmortem Series, where uh, we, yeah. we go back and um, we, we kind of dissect stories I've told in the past. You know, and it was uh, originally with stuff with Danny and, and the guys here, and we've evolved it to games ever and ever. Anyway, 
a few chapters or a few months from now, you know, some of our backers are going to get to a situation where that same thing happened as I designed this fetish. And then, oh, no, it'll be fine. This will be a neat little, and it was not a neat little. And I had to. <laughs> it was a little too much. I made a mistake. <laughs> and <laughs> But those things happen. So actually, in to, to go from that, I wonder in the creative process of things, you know, you talk about how, you know, it wasn't always just your call. How much would you say percentage wise of, of the whole creation of werewolf and building in that world or even the world of darkness in general was was you and how much was the committee thinking getting in the way? Oh, I mean, I mean, um, I mean, definitely in the first edition, you, you know, any content that got in there went through me, right? Mm -hmm. So was it my idea though? No, I mean, a lot of the ideas weren't, you know? And so we were so busy at that time. We had a large group. A lot of people were involved, um, you know, um, and, um, you know, sort of had to prune down the ideas and, and make it work. But there's a lot of writers, you know, everything went through me. And, um, and then once that first edition came out, then it was more or less, on its own, and I was less involved. So I would say the first edition, even though not all the ideas are m mine, like everything in there was as I wanted it. Okay. From yeah, there, yeah. It, it it began evolving rapidly in ways I never could envision. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> you know, fair. Uh, uh, just just because I had to go on to the next game, right? I had to work on Mage. I had to work on Wraith. I had to work on Changeling live action, you know, uh, LARP rules, then the TV show, of course, computer games, right? It just it just was a massive amount of work for one person. So it would be impossible for me to, to, to work on Werewolf in any kind of realistic way. So that's why we had these developers, and we had a very competent one on Werewolf, and he ran with it for almost forever. I'm sure you know who I'm talking about. Uh <laughs> Yeah, at that I, point, it's really I, I understandable. So. I don't know if, um, because, you know, you get to the subject of, of the other people who have taken over the reins over the years. You know, the three of you have always been, because, I mean, this game was is so important to me, you know. I mean, I'm sure you get people telling you their, their stories, the, you know, all the time. But this, this game changed my life. I'd probably be in prison right now, if not for Werewolf, honestly. Yeah, um, and people in prison do play Werewolf. <laughs> well, I, okay, but I'm not one of them. And I'm thankful for that. <laughs> but you know, you know, yeah, there was, yeah, a, yeah. was an angry kid who found an outlet through your game. You know, yeah, that's great. That's actually what you want, right? It, well, exactly. You want you what you want. You want your your games to be like um, have a positive effect on people. If it became something that sort of guided you away from you know violence and crime, that is truly awesome. I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah, I mean, and so am I, obviously. So it is. It's it's really great to be able to sit here and talk to you, and it, you know, the idea of you. It, it's it's like that that it's the thing you never expect to happen, you know. And so here yeah. I am, all these years later, still playing the game. I'm you know, everywhere I go, you know, every place I've lived, I've I've set up groups, I've introduced people, you know. Now I'm on the air. It's been what four years now uh -huh. that we've been uh, trying to show people werewolf the way that I see it. You know, see it through yeah. my eyes, fall in love with this thing because there's so much here to fall in love with. There's other stuff too, because, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's the, the old camel, right? You know, the camel's a horse owned by committee, but <laughs> there's, yeah. there's so many great things here. Um, and that's actually something I, I'd, I'd be interested in too, is that, you know, again, the camel's a horse, you know, they say the camel's the horse done by committee. Right. Um, I, I've always been a proponent for strong editorial. You know, I'm a big comic guy too. And I look back to like the Jim Shooter era of Marvel comics where no one that talks about Jim Shooter has anything nice to say about Jim Shooter. They always talk about what a monster he was or what a, what a dick he was, what a pain in the ass he was to work with. But in terms of editorial for Marvel comics, that was the golden age of the company. It ran so yeah, well, it yeah. was so cohesive, and he was on top of everything and made sure all the parts moved correctly. Yep, yep, <laughs> and, and made sure the tone was consistent and fit, yes. and then made sure all the, all, all the storylines sort of merged and interacted, and, but yet didn't collide. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing when done right. So they didn't it's like really hard Jim to do. And so they didn't like Jim Shooter because he was super critical of the thing he loved so much? I mean, I love that you put it that way, yes. <laughs> It's that he made yeah. it, a, he made it, you, it's what I've said on the show how many times. You can write whatever you want, but you can't write whatever you want. Yes. I was, I was <laughs> yeah. kind of leading into yeah. that. <laughs> so I'm glad you picked but it I, up. But actually, that, that, that's usually the perfect person to run something is someone who can see all its flaws, you know, and its limitations. 
And comic books has certainly got limitations, right? And it certainly had a a more not juvenile but jejun audience, you know. And that's a limitation too. But yet it's this glorious art form, and and having someone like him is is key. You know, that's one great thing about being a, a creator is that you're allowed, you know, to be have a more jaundiced view of your own creation than someone who's a uh, more of a hire, hireling, right? Because you know, people accept that you can be critical of your own creation. It's seen as cool, right? But, sure. you know, if you're hired and you have that attitude, people start something like, wait a minute, you should, if I had your job, I would be loving every bit of it, and I would <laughs> love the product to death, and how can you say a negative thing? And it's sort of like, well, that's the people you want. You want someone who can say a negative thing about a product and love it, and also, at the same time, be able to see the, its limitations. No, absolutely. And, but I, th- I mean, I think there's a, a large value in the word no, that I think maybe isn't appreciated as much anymore. You know, I'm, I'm a, I don't want to say I'm a big fan of the word no, but I will say that when I'm not afraid to tell someone no. And when I tell them no, I will tell them why, because oh, I feel yeah. that's important too. I was going to say that was, that's more of the reason why no is so important is because you have the why behind it. Well, I think it's important so that everyone understands what you're going for in a creative process. And maybe I'm talking out of my ass here. I haven't made a world of darkness, but <laughs> you know, I, yeah. I look at some of the inconsistencies through the lines and these things happen because you have a lot of people working together and I, and especially narrowing that down to werewolf. Right. And I mean, this isn't so much because I mean, this is stuff talking, especially in the later editions, you'll see things that directly contradict things that were previously mentioned or cornerstones of the game. And I look at that and I go, how did that get in the book? <laughs> who who was afraid to say no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you find that to be a problem back in the in the early days? Of have people who told me no? Or, or, or being you. the person saying no or yeah. being in a position to... Oh, yeah. Me, me saying no was always very, very hard because I was stretched so thin that people would justifiably go, well, you don't know enough about what I'm in the middle of. So how can you say no? Oh. And I would be like, well, I'm trying to exert this editorial control over all the lines and make them go in one direction. And we got to do it this way or we're going to kill the golden goose. And and then there'd be a lot of pushback on that, you know? So it was always very hard to do that, especially when you're not there full time. And, you know, if I was away, let's say at Hollywood or whatever, uh, you know, I wasn't there full time, so it was very tricky. Also, I was very young at the time, right? So people tend to not judge, listen to someone who is younger. Yeah. So it's always tricky, right, to be the one to say no. But you, you know, that's part of the artistic thing, though, is that you have to know how to say no, and you have to get people to listen to you. It's very, you know, because that's a key part of creating great content. And sometimes you have to go, no, I don't want that. It's like all the covers we did for vampire right i said no to them all that's why we ended up with a green marble and which, which is why we had the cover for werewolf you know we knew we wanted the rusted metal and so we went out and looked for rusted metal and i said no like 10 <laughs> times was the wrong rusted metal <laughs> it just didn't match what you were looking for but see, yeah there you, yeah. Go. So you, so you have to be able to say no is a key thing you know and i always tell people this that you know the key thing in any kind of creativity is you have to be able to kill your darlings, you know, which is the old classic, you know, writer's advice. Kill your darlings, that which you love the most. If you're not willing to kill it off for the sake of the story, then you're not doing the story a service. And, you know, a lot of people fall in love with things that come up with their creativity, and they somehow believe that creativity is in short supply, right? <laughs> yeah. And as soon as you think creativity is in short supply, then you're not going to be as creative anymore, right? But yet they hang on to things thinking, well, I can't get rid of my creative idea. That's precious. And it's like, no, your creative idea is not precious. What's precious is the beautiful final product that you've used your artistic judgment to weave together this perfect thing. And to get there, you have to kill your darlings. And that's something that, that is hard to do, but you have to be able to do it. Oh, I, I totally agree. You know, and I mean, when we go to these kind of these platitudes, you know, I also stand with with um, the, the good is the enemy of great, and, and really, it's it's all in service to that that greater piece, that greater work, that that larger story. You know, something I've always loved about Werewolf, uh, and, and I believe this is true above 
the rest of the world of darkness. And you might school me in a minute. I, I might I might take a beating here in a second here. But I've always felt that, um, even in compared to the other ones, that, that there was a level of um, selfishness that isn't there in Werewolf. Or maybe a selflessness. You know, it's the idea you have pack and tribe. You have the Garu who are fighting for Gaia, for fighting something bigger than themselves. The pack is greater than the individual. And vampire, you're kind of out for you. And yes, Wraith, it's yes. about, you know, it's, the rest is about me, where Werewolf is about the greater good, the, is about the us, about, you know, yeah, the cause. Yeah, 100%. 100%. And I don't know how we got there. Because that's not obvious from the beginning. A lot of Werewolf movies is about me, right? And you're I think I think what the reason I got there is because I knew right away it had to be about rage, right? Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. werewolf, the the whole the whole myth and motif definitely seemed about you know losing control, and becoming full of rage, and of course you know I grew up with Lou Ferrigno as the Hulk, <laughs> yep. you know, <laughs> so I kind of re- remembered that as sort of being as part of the same archetype, you know, of, of hulking out. But to balance that, it felt like, well, what are you going to balance that out with? Because the raging out is ultimately a very, very selfish act, right? Like someone in a family, like we all know someone like this, a friend or a family member who, rather than, you know, deal maturely with a problem, they'll lose their temper, right? And, and, and that always seemed to me to be a narcissistic thing. Like, oh, you get to lose your temper, but I don't. You know, I've got to be the mature one. You don't. You lose your temper. That's it's very selfish, right? That's a very me act. Like, you know, like if you truly love someone, like a child, right, your goal is to not lose your temper with them, right? Now, f- what I do is I've gotten to the point now where I have to fake losing my temper so they know that what they did is really serious, but I'm not really losing my temper. I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm doing... The, the play acting of it a little bit, just so they understand, oh, like running on a traffic, that's a really serious thing. You cannot ever do that again. You know, that kind of thing. Sure. So anyway, with Werewolf, then, the whole point was to do, to balance out the selfishness of the rage, was to do something that would put it in stark contrast. And the perfect thing was to make the whole game about the collective, about doing good, about, you know, seeking out, and fighting this this evil, which you know, at the time, and I still do, you know, think is you know us destroying the world, right? You know, we're just heedlessly, <laughs> you know, we're just heedlessly wrecking the world, like, yep. and it's just it just kills me. Oh no, it's, um, it's pretty funny to this day. No, I, I'm gonna stop you real quick here, Mark, because uh, <laughs> Porter's doing a little happy dance. <laughs> you gotta stop saying that. I've done fist pumps. I have not danced, everybody. <laughs> Danny is a liar. I have done triumphant <laughs> fist pumps. <laughs> triumphant happy dance. That is not a I'll, dance. I'll, I'll I know you're white, a but happy dance. Does that make I think it's funnier. So. Uh, damn it! <laughs> you know, you're, you're doing the Pulp Fiction happy. Uh, I mean, the Reservoir Dogs happy dance where he's dancing with Ooh, the knife. You little know? Michael Madsen. Yeah, yeah right. Madsen. I'm into it. I'm, now I'm doing that. Actually, now he's doing so. it. <laughs> Hello. No, no, no Porter's so, insane. So, 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 I mean, it, it, it's our, no, our but, tends to be really well better when you juxtapose these big themes, right? Yeah, no, so Porter's been saying the same thing the, for a long the time. Of, of, the, of the rage moment, of, of the raging out, with sort of this altruism of fighting and sacrificing yourself for this greater goal, and not even getting recognized for it, like you're fighting and no one even knows you're there, because uh, no one even knows you, you just do it even without any recognition, you know, it's, it's, it's like it's like billionaires giving to charity and not having their name on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's very much the werewolf thing, right? There's, your name is not on it, you know, you're doing this just for fame, maybe among other werewolves, but maybe not even that. And that but, juxtaposition is just such a profound, beautiful thing. No, And I... I I mean, I saw that from Jump Street, you know, like I, I always felt that. And I've said for years, this was Danny, Danny was getting to and he was dancing. Thanks. Um, uh, is that for years, and, and I've taken flack on this, you know, on the show, uh, being very clear that humanity is an antagonistic force in the world of darkness. <laughs> They're the ones dropping nuclear weapons and tearing up the earth. And like from a purely, I get we don't like to think of humans as the bad guy because we're humans, right? <laughs> but... 
But yeah, we have to stick to the yeah. You got to look it through the thought process of Garu in, in this game, right? And it's like in the world of Darkness, no, the humans are kind of an antagonistic force. Like you said, they're the ones doing all this shit. They're the ones yeah. destroying the planet. Yeah. And, the- and, and, and to be clear, I'm not anti-human by any. <laughs> well, no, no, but this is this is a fictional but, setting, but, and we're but, allowed but to think, do that. I think it is important to see us as an outsider who lived on Earth might see us. Exactly, you know, and and the werewolves are kind of half human and half something else, right? Right. And so, you know, from their point of view, it, it, humans would be a scourge, right? There's no doubt. Exactly. Like, 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 like and it would have been like, well, he, when humans were living on farms and burning wood, you know, not fossil fuels, it was <laughs> it was okay, it was dealable, you know. There's a billion humans total on the earth. You know, 150 years ago, right? It was, it was, it was doable, and uh, it's just so much more difficult now. You know, no, no, and, and, exactly. Uh, <laughs> it's just, it's funny. Like, I'm, I'm so thrilled to hear you t- say it because, again, I've said that for years. It's yep. like you have to shift your perspective. You know, you yeah, can't look yeah. at this as and, a because you're not playing for humans to just shift away from thinking as only from the human point of view, and that's part of what I want my games to be about. Is like, hey. You know, stop thinking only about reality as a human and think about, hey, what if you were something else other than human? What would you think? Yeah, what is your reality now? Yes. Yeah, well, how how would you see even basic things like time, like roads, like pollution? What would your perspective be? And I think it would be radically different, you know? And that was a huge one because we did a episode... It was probably our first year. We did the Red Talon episode. Oh, God. (laughs) And it changed Porter's perspective almost a full 180. Well, that was one of those fun episodes where the more I was talking about it, the more into it I got. I think another great one was the um, the Silent Striders, where I turned. I went from Shoe Horse was a pimp to Shoe Horse was a lazy prick (laughs) through the course of a half hour. I just completely turned on the NPC for the course of half hour. It's not a great episode, but it's fun. It's notable for that. <laughs> yeah. Just the more I talked about it, I'm like, you know what? No, he, he was yeah. about to finish set and then just didn't. What, was he on a coffee break? <laughs> Ever since he's been that fucking layabout shoe. <laughs> the guy who never finishes. <laughs> I, I digress. Sorry. But no, I, I enjoy it that way because I've actually, and I don't even remember where I heard this from. It was probably from some movie. But it was a line from the movie, and it put the rest of Werewolf into a huge perspective for me. And the line was, the strength of the wolf is his strength of the pack. And that made yes. so much sense to me. And it, it, it's helped bring like this game to life. It's helped bring my character into life. To hear you say, yes, we're <laughs> it, it's all about that selflessness, and it's all about the pack, and the complete the the justification from the rage that's so it's such a big deal now because yeah thank you (laughs) (laughs) yeah and and honestly anytime you know as a storyteller you want to create a big moment you know juxtapose two opposite things and it's gonna work every time (laughs) you know like 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 that's what makes these big moments i think really work um and movie set pieces and models and, and role playing. Like if you can sort of put two opposite things together and sort of play them off each other and show, you know, how they could work within one person, let's say, or within a group, it's, it's good stuff. Yeah. What, what mentioned in movies and really going to scale that back to TV. And if this is, um, if this is a sort and we'll sell right the hell by, but I actually watched Kindred the Embraced when it was on the air. <laughs> And, uh, yeah. oh, okay. <laughs> how, how much, I mean, obviously you show up there, the idea of there's, Hey, there's going to be a world of day. It's a vampire TV show. This is the foot in the door. This could have been massive. And then Aaron spelling is there. Yeah, that was, that was the, you know, he promised me that it was going to be not done like his other shows. And in fact, he did move away from it a fair bit. But just including the cops in there was just bad. And it was just of its time, right? Another four years later, they would have gone, yeah, we don't need cops in this. The cops were there, you know, to sort of represent the viewer, to help them enter into the world, you know, and make it easier for them to deal with. It had the potential to be so much more, 
you know, I think, in fact, if we'd been able to do more seasons, um, it could have evolved into something really good. You know, I'm, I'm inclined to agree. Um, I, I, this but, isn't a fair... Mark, Mark died, you know, of a motorcycle yeah. accident in London. And was very sad. So it made that made so it this instantly took any chance of us coming back, made it impossible. Which, which is a real shame because what could have been right. And I mean, you mentioned that if yeah. it had been allowed to continue, yeah. you know, I look at and this isn't really a, a one for one, but but I look at something like uh, some years ago when when they did that Green Arrow show, and I remember watching the first season of that, going, "This is garbage. <laughs> this is terrible." And and the second season came about, and for some reason I'm still watching it, right? Because I just don't I don't like myself too well. And um, <laughs> season two was actually really good. You know, it was like they they had to put their foot in the water to prove that the concept could work. And and I I do I I believe that had had it have continued on and it had proved to the people at the network and you know, all the, the the guys in the suits that you no know, people could latch onto this concept that, that I would wish you'd have had a lot more freedom. To, yeah, to really send yeah. it home, and it could have been like the the show you tell people about, and go, well, then you can get through the first season. It's just yeah. get the first and, season. And they kind of understand. If, if I could have said to the agent who contacted me and said it's too soon, we want to wait a year, and we don't want spelling, that would have been smart. But he probably looked at me like I was insane, <laughs> right? Like, how do you say no to it? <laughs> and drop me yeah. like a hot potato, right? Oh yeah. In but, but then we sure would have been able to come in because so many shows stole from us, right? After that, oh sure, like like oh, yeah. you know, <laughs> like like even Twilight. She she was a uh, she was a LARP player supposedly, according <laughs> to lots of people from uh, <laughs> from her area. But you know, she was a she denies it, but there's so many shows and movie things that, that stole from us, you know, which by the way, is completely, you know, on, on, as long as you don't steal too directly, it's legal, right? It's as, sure. long as, you, as long as you're paying homage and you're not stealing actual trademarks and, you know, trade dress and all that kind of thing. It is technically legal. So which, I'm not, no, you know, I, I remember when all that was going on. Cause you know, again, I was a big part of the, the white wolf, the chat community. While that yeah, was going yeah. on, so I remember this thing that we're not talking about and can't talk about, and I know yep. that if if whatever we're talking about were to be a movie franchise, I boycotted it on a principle, and still have only seen the first one because an ex girlfriend demanded it, and you know you gotta, you gotta keep her happy, right? Um, yeah, yeah. But that's the only reason, and I've blatantly ever since refused. I I have you know, so I'm I'm with you there. It, I'll tell you as, as far as borrowing those, you bring that up. I think the thing that boggles my mind there, because you know there are plenty of shows, you know, out there where you could see that influence. I mean, um, I mean, there's the obvious stuff. I mean, you mentioned Twilight, but the obvious stuff like Blade, you know, which did not resemble the it resembled the world of darkness more than it did the comic. You know, you, yeah. you had shows like Netflix's Hemlock Grove, which you could see a little influence. I mean, it's the influence has been everywhere. Oh yeah, uh, but what his boggles I, it's, it's my unbelievable. Mind. It's unbelievable, actually. Like yeah. We were watching on Netflix the other night uh, a Italian werewolf movie, and partway through, I was like, "Wait a minute!" And and I went, "Oh, that's this werewolf." And my daughter goes, "What's what's that?" <gasps> and, my, no. and my son goes, "Dad, don't you know Daddy wrote that? He they stole it from him." I go to my son. Oh, you, you, no. He goes, yeah, I, I looked it over. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, someone's getting a new bike. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so it was like, uh, even this, you know, rather odd, but interesting, you know, Italian movie that my daughter was watching dubbed I, on Netflix was like, oh yeah, they borrowed some stuff from werewolf for obviously. But what kills me about that, especially, you know, when, when, when I see, werewolf things because you know obviously we we keep an eye out right turn here yeah. of all places this podcast might be <laughs> a little looking out for werewolf related things it's crazy but all the time you know how often they don't rip off the good shit yeah <laughs> it's always yeah. you know the full yeah. moon i'm gonna lose control and become an uncontrollable rage you can shift the crinos whenever you want sir and if you were ripping off the right shit you would know that and people would love this yeah yeah <laughs> Well, here's the thing is that a lot of script writers, they know stories and characters. They do not know worlds. And so even when they're borrowing stuff to create the world, they don't know what the right stuff is to create the world. They just choose whatever fits, makes their story work. But, and, that's and, the they thing, don't they, to, and they're not trying to create a coherent world. They're just trying to create a coherent story. 
And that's a mistake. Yes, you know, it is. You need a create a coherent world and a story at the same time. And some people get it, like Star Wars. It's a fantasy story, of course, but Lucas created in that first movie a coherent world. Beyond that, I felt like it existed beyond a story, even yes. though it really didn't, <laughs> you know, because he made the right choices. Um, a lot of writers just don't have that ability. They don't know how to world build. World building is one of those very rare abilities that most writers don't have, which is why they shouldn't try it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm, to be honest, I'm kind of thankful for it because it, it puts a spotlight on the people who can all the more. Uh, yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. And it's something, by the way, AI could never do because world building is, you know, like a story. AIs can easily create new stories because it's just every story is a repeat of other every other story, right? They're just done in different ways with different, you know, there's an infinite combination, but they're made of the same ingredients. But world building, <laughs> like a good world is brand new, right? It's something that's never been seen before. It's imagined from a mind. It maybe borrows some ingredients, but it's fundamentally new. It's different. And that's why we love worlds so much when these worlds are created because they're just brand new. It's just really cool. And then suddenly, when you have a brand new world, what is possible? Ah, uh, a new kind of story that's only possible in that world. That's cool. It, well, yeah. You know, I mean, that's a thing. And I, I, I hate to do this, right? Because it sounds like I'm blowing smoke. Like, I, I, I don't mean to be fangying out here, but, you know, it's, again, when I first discovered werewolf. And, you know, there, there's, there was no shortage of werewolf fiction out there, of folklore, of legend, you know, books and crappy movies, and there was no shortage of it. But there was a difference between the Garu and the Garu Nation and a werewolf. Yes. And even a wolfman. I like to say wolfman. <laughs> and Alon Shady Jr. was a wolfman. <laughs> the Howling were werewolves. These are Garu. You know, and it's again, it's the world building. It, it's the the premise in in the the mission to save Gaia. It's the Umbra in the interactions with the spirits. It's the tribes and the tribal culture and the interactions between yeah, them. Yeah. And yes, the Forbes are badass. In the you know, like all of that together, it was that world building that made and it anyone who did it before us. Right? People had werewolves before in gaming, and they never did that. They never went in depth to reinterpret and re understand the myth. Right. Exactly. And now, though, if you, you know, and so the werewolves always came across as this crazy guy in the moor, you know, raging <laughs> out or whatever. They had that part, but nothing else. And now when people think of werewolves, they always think of them as nature oriented, right? It's almost as protect. That's a very common trope now. You, you get more of that. It's, but it's, it's, it's part of the, the werewolf trope, in fact. But you, you, just, you know, you still don't like the get the cat It's part of the vampire trope. It's part of it now. It's part of it. It's the name uh, on TV tropes. You know, masquerade is the name for that particular trope of the group hiding, right? And that, that comes from the popularity of vampire. Um, and the same thing with werewolves being, you know, uh, the avenging spirits of nature. That's part of the werewolf mythology now, and that came out from the game. And that's that's kind of cool, I think. No, I agree. And I think it's very apt and very perfect for werewolves for that to be there it no, fits no i do it feels like it's been there all along even though it hasn't <laughs> no for sure and i mean you you have to you know there, there's there's got to be the pride there to know that you you've contributed that and it is such a big important part of the mythos and it's such a fundamental and i even want to say necessary change you know but it, it, it still boggles my mind that you still don't um you still don't see the, the, the ability, willful change in the, you know, the, the greater control in the forms. You know, I mean, I remember watching Supernatural for the whole series because, again, I don't like myself very well. Uh, <laughs> but that was a good show for a while and it would have werewolves and I'd get excited and lo and behold, it's the earth, the moon, I'm a wolfman again. The moon's full and I'm a gurn snarl and I can't do anything about it. And I just wait for the episode where like, a pack shows up and was like, yeah, that was Larry. He, he got hit in the head and his brain don't work too well anymore. Fucking get out of here, you two. <laughs> this is our territory. You know, you never see Yeah, it. yeah, like, yeah. On one hand, I'm good because it gives more importance to World of the Apocalypse. It, be, yeah, it becomes and, that And, 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 and here's the thing is that is that, you know, these, these writers who don't understand world building, they don't understand the importance of having exceptions and control and reasons why. They just want to be black and white because that's easy for them because they don't want to think about world building. 
and you know, and it's um, you know, uh, writers who don't don't respect world building or and who aren't good at it should be banned from working on any project that involves <laughs> world building. But I, unfortunately, that's not how it works, right? No, no, it's not. Um, I, I remember as a kid, you know, being such a huge comic guy. You know, I wanted to give me comics. I wanted to be an artist. Not, not that good of an artist. I'm a better writer. Turns out, you know, life lessons. But uh, I remember, you know, it's that dream to get into comic books. Oh, my God. And then as I got older, I started seeing the quality of the writing go down. And it's like, well, apparently they'll just give a job to anybody who pulls a ticket out of a Cracker Jack box now. Like, I don't even want to try to get like, They'll let anyone do it now. Shit. It's just lost the value. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, characters making comic book plot lines that are based off jokes that Family Guy did a decade previous. Like, I'm not impressed. <laughs> <laughs> What are we doing? Anyone can do anything now. It's crazy. But again, it yeah. just it puts a yeah. spotlight on the people who can. Anyway. Yes, yes. And, and it means there's going to always be one form of storytelling that's sort of more valuable and more, you know, that's always going to rise to the top. And so all these, you know, hacks, you know, are not going to be as that successful, right? So, and also anyone listening to this who wants to get into screenwriting, remember, you know, your big advantage is that like almost all the really great screenwriters and, um, you know, TV writers all were role players, right? Hmm. <laughs> like it's unbelievable. Like they are, they're all the great ones are writers or were role players or are role players. And you know, um, I, I've heard a rumor that, uh, Scorsese mm -hmm. and Spielberg are both big fans of Rage Across the Internet. So, you know, <laughs> really? I, well, we can't prove that's not true. You can't prove anything is not true. You can't prove it's not true. So, not true. Not I, true I hear that. a rumor that that's the, that's the case. <laughs> so, make sure you're current. I mean, Tarantino I definitely role played. Uh, you know, also a big fan um, of our work, maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I, you know, definitely werewolf, right? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we, werewolf, yeah, understandable. And, and, but RAI, hopefully. Oh, yeah. No, I'd let QT direct a uh, a proper Werewolf the Apocalypse movie or show. Keep a little arc. I could see him doing a hell of a job with that. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I don't... I, I can't be on my own here, surely. I mean, there's a way Absol to tweak um, Vincent Vega and um, Jules Winfield from Pulp Fiction in a pair of glass walkers. Oh, That's true. Yeah. It all works. Yeah, there's there's a lot of shows and movies we're we're constantly secret werewolf shows. Yeah, yeah secret werewolf shows. We call Stranger them. Things season one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead, go tell them that word. Yeah, yeah, Stranger Things season one is just the story of uh, a Pentex was a, a project uh, Odyssey escapee. You know, a little psychic girl who they were going to fuse with the Bane. She she gets free, but the cause of the experiment left a thinning in the gauntlet so this particular scrag is able to rip through back and forth and it's pentex trying to get their lab experiment back <laughs> wow wow not a werewolf in sight, but you tell me the upside down isn't basically the penumbra yeah i've actually done that as uh my way of um getting inspiration for games is i'll watch a movie that's not horror or you know um no no hint of the supernatural so like, like i'll use that as like a way of doing like uh inventing new games so like i'll take a movie like godfather and i'll go well it's not supernatural and it's not about it's not horror well it is horror in a way but it's not really horror <laughs> but but imagine that the, they were vampires well, absolutely and then re, then rethink about the movie and then suddenly it gives you all these ideas and so I think that's a really useful thing for any game master is just take a movie you love and reimagine it and then try to use that in your game. Not, not the whole story, but aspects of it. And it, it, oh, it's such a great tool for coming up with stuff. I could not agree more. You know, I, I, I do that myself. I, I use music a lot, too. You're big on music, yeah. Yeah, that, that's a big for me when, when I do my writing. A big inspirato. You know, I will take... Um, you, know, you hear the songs, you're like, no, this is this is actually about this. It's aggressively not, right? No one, except for Slipknot, wrote a song about Werewolf the Apocalypse. <laughs> did, you, did you know about that, about their demo? Uh, no. Uh, was it called Mate, Kill, Feed, Repeat? 
Yeah. Be, there might be a different order, but whatever the case, yeah, the entire, it, like it's uh, just a few tracks, but it's all literally about werewolf. Yeah, they have really, a, yeah, they, there's a song called Bonar suck fact. <laughs> no way. Yeah. Seriously. Seriously. Oh, that's so cool. Right. I did not know that. Wow. Like it's, it's not my band, but once I found out, I'm like, Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. They're not my favorite kind of music, but like, yeah, the fact that they have songs up specifically, well, they, they are there. mine now. I'm gonna <laughs> <go out> and- <laughs> yeah, it's like, when you see the lyrics, like I draw my clave and like, Holy shit. That's. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The whole clay thing came from Highlander, obviously. Oh, well, well. <laughs> that's fine. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> yeah, right. No, no. It's like, okay. What, what would be the archetypical weapon? Okay. Yeah. Hell yeah. Well, when you look at that, uh, Elbrecht Mari fight, the, the, the famous one mm-hmm. in most editions of the book, <laughs> you know, there's a little Christopher Lambert going on there. I can see it. Yeah. Yeah. That's so awesome. <laughs> well, I'm glad we could pass the Slipknot news on there. Yeah, yeah that, that demo. Maybe yeah, I mean, feed repeat. as soon as we're done here, I'm going to go listen to that. So I'm going to find it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, I kind of surprised you didn't even know about that. Well, you know. Well, you know, I, I only got back to the States recently, and I purposely lived my life abroad working in politics with not telling anyone like who I was, so... Like, I mean, that's and fair. I didn't really, I didn't really go online to, to do gaming stuff, you know. I, and I play board games mostly, to be honest. Which is you know, just cool. sort of have a new, a new. So yeah, I just was. I've been away from it for a long time. Hey, completely understandable. Well, I'm, I'm glad we could deliver you know, that piece. It's nice, it's <laughs> nice to be back. I really, I, fi- I found out I still love role playing a whole lot more than any other kind of game. You know, like even computer games or board games. I'm really into role playing. You know, and it's nice to be back where I can find a group, ma- mainly my kids and my ne- nieces and nephews. <laughs> Still, though, passing it on to the next you know? generation. That's yeah, no, it's it's great fun to do with, and and it's it's such a great activity. And just thinking about it, world building with it is so much fun, and game design. <laughs> and now you guys have got me completely. I'm really thinking a lot about Beast Night. So uh, <laughs> when I start on that, I need to reach out to you guys, and because uh, you got me excited about working on that actually <laughs> that's awesome no please do yeah you know, i'd be uh, and i'm wondering if, if uh like if you're doing it in medieval times we change that whole they're fighting to protect how how to do that you know and i don't think you do i think that's just built into where what where, where werewolves are now the protecting nature thing is just a built-in part of the archetype it's like you know vampires in the masquerade how, you can't have one without the other anymore can you well you can i guess True Blood said vampires were well, <laughs> but, 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 but 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 in a way that kind of what was ruined the show, right? Because it didn't really make sense. Like if humans knew vampires existed, they would fucking go out and kill them all. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, know, it made so much like, sense with both the veil and the masquerade. Because yeah, werewolves are real. Everybody start killing wolves yeah. is immediately and, what's going to happen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and then also it, it would basically just. It would be a world change for humans because suddenly be like, wait a minute, if vampires exist and werewolves exist, what else exists? And yeah. you have people would lose their fucking minds, <laughs> right? <laughs> it, would, it, it would change the face of the world. It'd be like if the existence of God was suddenly proven to every human being, right? It would just change humanity forever, right? It, it would just change everything, and they didn't show that in the sh- in the show. Not that I really watched the show. I just watched a few episodes. But, but I, I kept going, this doesn't make sense. The vampires, or everyone knew they existed, the world would be completely different, wouldn't it? I, I remember know? watching the, the first episode of that show. You know, you get all the hype for it because HBO did a good job with marketing. And sure. I sat down for the premiere. And I watched like a bunch more later on in life. But I, I sat there for that first episode. And I think it's like three minutes in when the first vampire pops his fangs. And two things happened, okay? Number one, they made the, the, the worst sound effect of all time. Tink! He's a tink! Like a little, tiny little switchblade. And then the fangs were on the wrong teeth. What? And yeah. I laughed yeah. so hard. <laughs> Just like the show's done. Jesus Christ. <laughs> you can't even get fangs right. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. But it did okay for a lot of seasons, but they kind of ruined the vampire thing a little bit. 
And once again, they put the focus on the non-vampires and being seduced and la da 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 da, which I, I think is almost always a mistake. Like vampires in and of themselves are the focus, and you know the monster is the focus. Like a werewolf show about humans. Well, having a human is fine, but the focus needs to be on the werewolf characters. That's that's what's interesting. Well, I mean, the, way, the way to do that is, and I know you know who I'm, who I'm talking to here, but the way you do that is is for your token point of view human to become the thing. It, it's the, the yes, human that was yes. embraced in their, their POV character into the world. It's, it's, the, it's the kid who woke up in the woods, stark raving naked, having dreams about running wild, now surrounded by wolves going, hey, you're one of us, stupid. It's that transition yeah. is that human, yeah. that formerly human character yeah. enters that world. Not as an outsider. You bring him in. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah. What's the, what's the classic way to introduce your viewer to the world is you have the character also be introduced to the world as well. Um, I mean, they just did that in Shogun, right? Uh, the, the, new, the new Shogun series is like, yeah. oh, most oh. people don't understand Japanese culture, certainly don't understand Japanese history, right? So you have this Englishman who is basically has to be taught everything. And while he's being taught this stuff, so is the audience. It's, it's classic, but it's classic for a reason. Yeah, and so, yeah, it works. It, it totally works. Now, now talking about Beast Knight and by extension Fang Knight, I think I think it to, to where where is someone going to go? Because we talked at the top of the show about this, and there are people going. I'm intrigued about this. Where do we go? Where where do we go to learn more? <clears throat> well, uh, go to LostLearnGames.com, and you can find out more. And you can sign up for our play testing, and we'll send you out for free a kit where you can sort of play test uh right now we have fang night which is the vampire game and we have badlander which is our kind of hunters hunted and next up we're going to be play testing the and i I'll, I'll, may start today working on it <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> good, pretty pretty jack i got some ideas guys thank you oh awesome uh, my pleasure yeah uh definitely want to talk to you offline about more werewolf stuff of ideas shoot by you but um the beast night which i you know i think is uh these are our so, yeah, basically that's where we're going to go, and we'll be having Kickstarter soon. And um, you can also find me on uh, Facebook. Um, we have a Lost Learn Games group. Yeah, we'd love to sign people up for playtesters. We we're looking always looking for writers and artists. So uh, reach out. You heard it. You heard it right from the man's mouth, everybody. LostLearn.com and so I don't know how Facebook works, honestly. <laughs> I, I barely, but it's funny because I, I, there, there was a time, you know, I had, I mean, I got my Facebook and I would use it to let people know when I was coming to town. Yeah. And that was pretty much it. Yeah, that's you know? all you would say. It was just a mass group message like, hey, I'm coming back. <laughs> yep. But Mark, I know you're a busy guy. I uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we'd love to have you back sometime if you're open to it. Uh, absolutely. Uh, let me know. I would love to do that. Excellent. Awesome. Thank um, you so much, Mark. Yep. Appreciate thanks. you being here, man. Absolutely. Uh, you have yourself a good Perfect one. And time. Take care, my friend. All right. See you later. Bye bye. Thanks See for listening, you. everyone. Thanks again, Mark. Thanks again, Mark. Take you care. Bet. All right. You too. Bye. One hell of a comeback episode, huh? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> well, I hope that was worth the wait. Uh, and uh, and we are officially back. No more vacation. No summer hiatus this year, by the way. Hey, we're not coming back for like two months and going, hey, we're going to take the summer off. No, 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 no. no, no. We're back, baby. Yeah, we are. Don't call me baby. Uh, <laughs> we're back, bitches. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't matter. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, tune in next week for the next chapter of uh, maybe the last chapter. Uh, I, I, well, it's the, yes. Of wherever guy takes us. It's the finale. Yeah. Well, the Chronicle will be called something different next time. A different Chronicle name, so true so we'll be the end of wherever guy takes us yes this is the, which I'm, yeah. I'm sick of saying it now anyway <laughs> i used to really like that name but fucking 13 <laughs> chapters bi-weekly later and several parts per chapter especially right. this one who has now six parts no yeah. it's, it's like six fucking months later i'm tired of saying wherever guy takes us i just say you know done with it <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I love that title so much it's over now i hate it um, <laughs> but <laughs> Obviously, the you know we have the the actual play will be next week, and then come back for another normal episode. 
Hey, we are back. Thank you so much for sticking with in the interim. We hope you enjoyed the shit out of this episode. Yeah. And a uh, huge thank you to Mark. Oh, yeah. Wow. Fucking Mark Ryan Hagen, believe it or not. It just happened. <laughs> oh, we've um, been holding on to that for a long time. Yeah, it's going to be nice to finally talk about it. Yeah. Because it's cause just like a lot of the stuff that was cut in the episode we can't talk about. <laughs> like We might be playing up that cutting thing, but... <laughs> <laughs> what? But yeah, stay tuned. Thank you so much for sticking with us. You know, uh, we hope we you gain some more support down the line. Stick around, have some more fun with us. There's some more changes coming, but some, nothing some earth big shattering. Changes. Some some tweaks. All right, tweaks. We'll say tweaks. But it's it's all going to be a good time. So for uh, behalf of myself and Mr. Daniel Tyson and the absent C of J <laughs> and M and Tom. And fuck it, Grant says hi, too. <laughs> Why not? That Behalf of everybody. Can, that way we can see he was on the episode and he'll actually listen. There you go. There you go. <laughs> you know what we're going to do? We're going to be like, someone brought your name up. I don't know. See? Mm-hmm. See, he's going to think, oh, what did Mark say about me? Fucking yep. suck it, Grant. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say that. <laughs> no, we love you all. Thank you so much for everything. You know, thank you for your support. You take care of yourselves, take care of each other, keep your claws sharp, your head in the swivel. Be a, a real bitch, keep them in order, too. <laughs>